So he was a much more of a hands-on, practical-minded person. And that set him aside from the rest of the family in many ways. And uh, he went on a different sort of trajectory and in various ways kind of uh, kept stepping further and further away from the family orbit until he finally left New York and headed to Arkansas in 1953. And that was really Winthrop sort of stepping out of his family orbit for the last time and really staking his own place and his own ground uh, to become his own person. Uh, when he moved away from those influences. Hello, I'm Derek Cash with the North Little Rock Public Library System and want to welcome you to Meet the Author. Joining us today is Dr. John Kirk, the George W. Donaghy Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. He is here with us today to discuss his book, Winthrop Rockefeller, From New Yorker to Arkansas, 1912 to 1956. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me along. Yes. All right. Um, why don't we begin? I'll let you have an opportunity. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Well, as people may be able to tell from my accent, I'm not originally from Arkansas. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in the United Kingdom. Uh, just in the north, near, I just outside of Manchester. And uh, I did most of my education there. Uh, I did my undergraduate and graduate degree there. Um, and uh, my graduate degree at the University of Newcastle on Time was on the history of the civil rights movement in Arkansas. And that's how I got interested in Arkansas and uh, went backwards and forwards for almost 20 years doing research on various topics. And then in 2010, uh, I applied for and got the job of chair of the history department here at uh, UA Little Rock. I did that for five years. Uh, then I was director of the Amnesty Institute on Race and Ethnicity for four years. Uh, then we had COVID, and now I'm back on faculty and uh, have just published my 10th book, which is a biography of Winter Rockefeller. Well, congratulations on that, because <clears throat> I was really entertained by this book and I was impressed with your analysis, um, the research. I think it's a fabulous bibliography uh, for anyone uh, who's just interested in it, but also for any scholars. Um, did you have, um, were there any difficulties getting sources? Was there anything that was off limits or did, was it pretty easy going to find all the sources you needed for this book? Yeah, I was quite forward, uh, quite fortunate, actually. Um, you know, I um, got a uh, um, a grant from the Rockefeller Archives in New York. So the Rockefeller Family Archives are in New York City. And I uh, applied for a grant there, and I was the first uh, inaugural scholar in residence uh, in 2009, just before I moved to Arkansas. So I'd already started on the Rockefeller Biography Project before I moved to the state. And then just a year later, I uh, moved to Arkansas and the Winthrop Rockefeller collection, uh, the main body of papers I used are here at the Center for Arkansas History and Culture in downtown Little Rock. So I was very lucky to have them right on my doorstep and, uh, and I managed to find other sources as well. Uh, one of the most fun uh, sources, one of the most fun trips I had was to interview David Rockefeller, who was Winthrop's brother younger brother. Uh, he was uh, 101 years old at the time. He's uh, sadly passed now, but I interviewed him in 2005 and I got to travel to New York and go to his uh, upper east side apartment, which was very nice, and kind of look around and sit with him for an hour uh, and uh, talk with him. At the time, he was the, had the title of the world's oldest billionaire. So it was kind of fun to sit down with him and, and talk to him. And uh, the further back we went with his memories, which was the early years that I really wanted to, uh, uh, to talk about, um, the sharper he was. So it was um, it was uh, one of the highlights of the research, for, for sure, getting to speak to David Rockefeller, who was, of course, you know, CEO of Chase Manhattan Bank for most of the 1980s. <clears throat> Along those same lines, what did he think of his brother? Uh, well, you know, uh, Winthrop had was one of five brothers, the so-called mm -hmm. brothers generation of the family. And there was a whole uh, complicated set of links between those different uh, familial relationships. 
Uh, the oldest brother was John uh, D. Rockefeller III, and of course he inherited the name and the seniority in the family. Uh, they had an older, older sister, of course, Abby, who was the oldest in the family, but as the woman in the brother's generation, she was sidelined from a pretty early age because of the sort of patriarchal nature of the family. Uh, the second uh, brother was Nelson Rockefeller, of course, went on to be governor of New York and vice president of the United States and uh, Gerald Ford. And uh, he was very rambunctious and, you know, struggled to be the number one uh, heir to the throne, even though he wasn't born to the throne and that kind of struggle for the rest of his life. Uh, then there was Lawrence, who was the businessman and entrepreneur, and he and Nelson were very fast friends together. And Winthrop was kind of sidelined and bullied by his two older brothers, which the book talks about his place in the family. And David was the sort of younger brother, uh, the baby of the family. So Winthrop was in this very awkward fourth son position and uh, struggled to find his place and way uh, in the family from quite an early age. What was Winthrop like? I mean, I've read the book, but for the audience sake, what was Winthrop like? And a question I specifically want to ask is, did you think he was dumb? Because you bring up a lot of uh, his uh, time at, the, at university and the struggles that he had. Right. No, I don't think he was dumb at all. I think he had a very different kind of sensibility to his brothers. Now, his brothers all went into business. They were office-bound people. They, you know, liked um, being in charge of hierarchical organizations and taking on those roles. And Winthrop was far more a kind of hands-on person. He didn't like being trapped in an office. And that showed from a very early age, of course, you know, he left Yale University to go work an apprenticeship in the oil fields, starting off as a roughneck uh, and roused about labourer and uh, working his way up through the industry over over three years. So he was much more of a hands-on, practical-minded person, and that set him aside from the rest of the family in many ways. And uh, he went on a different sort of trajectory and in various ways kind of uh, kept stepping further and further away from the family orbit until he finally left New York and headed to Arkansas in 1953, and that was really... Winthrop sort of stepping out of his family orbit for the last time and really staking his own place and his own ground uh, to become his own person uh, when he moved away from those influences. From my impression of the way you write about him, Winthrop seems like a rather relaxed, easygoing person, as if as if you'd want to make him your friend, as if like if you were in his house or eating dinner with him, even though he was um, you know, a multimillionaire, you would feel very comfortable. He wouldn't make you feel awkward. What do you think I'm my analysis is correct? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, he was very approachable, and that's another way that he was set aside from his brothers. You know, his brothers were sort of comfortable and happy living in the pretty privileged and elite world. And Winthrop never really sort of settled into that world. You know, from a very early age, because he was bullied by his brothers and he couldn't find his place in the family, a lot of the time when they spent weekends at his great uh, at his grandfather's uh, place up in Westchester County, he would end up playing with the sons and daughters of the groundsmen and the housekeepers rather than his own family. And from a very early age, he sort of mixed with people that the other brothers didn't really mix with. Then he felt very comfortable around those people, you know. And after that, he moved into the oil fields with the roustabouts and the laborers and kind of lived in the bunk houses there with them and among them and could survive that. And then afterwards, he uh, spent a long time in the military and uh, in the Second World War in the army, in both in the United States and in overseas service. And he was very comfortable around the men there and fight, you know, in the in the battlefield and sort of um, in those contexts. And in some ways, you know, when he moved to Arkansas, he was a fairly natural fit. You know, he could get along with people who were from, you know, outside of his elite world and was pretty comfortable and easily accessible among them and sort of seemed to feel most comfortable in those kind of in those sorts of settings. I am curious because his name is Rockefeller. It, it, it surprises me that he adapted 
or that the Arkansans accepted him as much as they did, because this is a a southern state and we're not like California or New York. Did it kind of did it take you by surprise? Do you understand the question I'm trying to to address in that here's this multimillionaire coming down here, a Rockefeller, and the people that seem to have accepted him. I mean, later on, he's elected governor. Mm. Well, it was an odd match for certain. Uh-huh. And it was kind of odd for a Rockefeller to move to a place like Arkansas in the mid-1950s. But, you know, I think one of the reasons that they welcomed him with open arms is that he brought a lot of money with him and a lot of influence at a time when Arkansas was going through a very tough patch. You know, uh, Arkansas was a state that lost more of its population than any other state between 1940 uh, and the 1960s. Uh, you know, the, the, the state was becoming rapidly depopulated because it had a declining cotton economy and no new industry and businesses were being set up in the state. So people were leaving in their droves and the state was, you know, pretty desperate. And for Rockefeller to come and to bring his own personal wealth there, but to bring his influence as well, uh, was a crucial part of why the people embraced him. And, you know, the, the governor at the time, Orville Forbes, lost no uh, time at all in dragging him into state politics and appointing him as head of the Arkansas Industrial Development Commission uh, in 1955, just two years after he came to the state. And Winthrop uh, set off earnestly uh, trying to promote business and industry in the state and was very successful using his national contacts to bring uh, businesses and jobs and investment money to the state. And Arkansas in the 60s began to develop industries that would stabilize its population and stabilize its economy. So he was a very important part of the state's prosperity. And, uh, and so, you know, he was very welcome uh, in that context too. An impression I get in the book is that as a Rockefeller, you weren't an individual, you were a part of a firm. It seems like there's a, a junior, as you call him, the father, uh, is like the head of, uh, I, forget, uh, I don't, don't know the impression, it was like control, there was a lot of intense control over how you're allowed to act, how you're allowed to behave, and that your individual thoughts and maybe rights were came second, that we have to protect ourselves almost as if like there were like a different country within the United States. Do you understand the impression? Could you comment on that? Am I correct? Yeah, I think so. You know, and there's an interesting parallel, I think, between the uh, the, um, the Rockefellers and the Kennedys. You know, there are two very different sorts of families, but two uh, big power brokers. And the Rockefellers were the kind of more private Kennedys. They were okay. the ones behind the scenes rather than the public face of that family. But then there's an interesting parallels between the two families. But yeah, a very strong uh, sort of patriarch who was, as the book details, was not above beyond using money to bribe and cajole his uh, sons and daughters. And, you know, he offered them money not to smoke before they turned 21. He offered Winthrop money not to drink in the oil field. So, you know, he uh, exercised moral control through the uh, purse strings that he had. But I think uh, as a group of people, that brother's generation uh, was very much a, a unit. And, you know, books were written and articles were written uh, just before the Second World War when they all came of age that lumped them as a collective unit for almost 20 years. You know, it was the Rockefeller brothers, very much them. And, of course, when Winthrop moved away, he kind of, to some degree, broke up that and stepped outside of that um, more insular uh, identity, and he, he staked his own individual identity apart from that. So it was a fairly radical move. But a really important one in terms of the Rockefeller family, you know, none of the brothers did that. And uh, in family histories, uh, a lot of the generation that came after the brothers generation in uh, they call it the cousins generation afterwards, after the brothers. And many of those sort of followed in with Rockefeller's footsteps. He kind of broke the mold of what was expected of a Rockefeller and sort of blazed a trail for other things that a Rockefeller could do. And in particular, his nephew, uh, Jay Rockefeller, who was John D. Rockefeller the fourth, um, you know, he kind of followed in Winthrop's footsteps and moved south. He moved to West Virginia, another uh, impoverished state, and became governor there too and spent a lot of time 
on Petty Jean Mountain with Winthrop, his uncle, sort of getting advice from him too. So Winthrop sort of blazed a, a different sort of trail for the idea of what it was like to be a Rockefeller and what a Rockefeller could actually do and get away with within the family. I'm glad you explained that because now I have a better concept. It's not only as as a, as a unit, but also that the press sort of uh, reconfirmed that by writing about the the brothers as a unit. So it kind of you get it not only from the family's point of view, but also from the uh, the press uh, publications kind of reconfirming that. Okay. So right. an, entire, an entire books were written on the Rockefeller brothers, you know, okay. Jay Alex Morris, Morris brought one out in the fifties. Alvin Moscow was still writing about the Rockefeller brothers in the 1970s. So for 20 years, you know, they were seen as this collective unit uh, and, you know, not only articles, but entire books were written about this brother's generation. Okay. All right. Now, in your book, you talk about race relations in the South and Rockefeller's successes in dealing with things like that. Comment, comment, if you will, on, on that sort of theme. Yeah, um, one of the things that Winthrop uh, staked his claim as uh, in the family, trying to find his own identity within uh, that framework was race relations. And uh, he had an interest in that before the Second World War, and he joined the board of the National Urban League, which was one of the big six civil rights organizations in the country. But particularly when he got back from uh, World War II, he threw himself into work uh, with the National Urban League and became a national speaker for them. He addressed the national conferences. He helped to raise money for them. And perhaps most significantly, uh, he actually donated a large sum of money to them to buy a new headquarters in uh, New York City. So he was heavily invested in civil rights before it became a national phenomenon and, uh, you know, described himself when he was interviewed by the Chicago Defender, which was one of the largest and most popular black newspapers in the country, as, you know, the Rockefeller brother who was most interested in race relations. So he'd really publicly... Uh, state a claim to be the spokesperson for the family on race relations. And, of course, that followed him down to Arkansas. And one of the reasons that uh, there was some reticence and some wariness about Winthrop Rockefeller was because of his known sort of uh, what in Arkansas classes very liberal views on race relations in the mid-1950s. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, okay. And, of course, one of the things that he did was, uh, just to add to that, is that, uh -huh. you know, um, uh, one of the things he did when he came to Arkansas was that he brought uh, one of his close friends uh, and uh, work associates with him, Jimmy Hudson, uh, who he'd known in New York, to Arkansas, and installed him as general superintendent of uh, the farms at Petty Jean Mountain, which was unheard of at the time. And, you know, he, uh, of course, struggled in that environment, but Winthrop let it be known to everyone that he would not... Uh, work with anyone who wouldn't work with Jimmy Hudson and work through him. And everybody wanted a bit of the money that was going into, uh, you know, developing Petty Jean Mountain, and everybody did, had to work through Jimmy Hudson. And they quickly learned that, and he quickly earned the locals' respect and I think changed a lot of minds and ideas about the role uh, that of African Americans in the state and certainly around the Moralton area. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you. You cannot read this biography and not ask a question about Bobo Rockefeller. What did you think of her? Well, she's a very fascinating figure uh -huh. uh, in her own right. I mean, it, it was the whole, you know, the, 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 uh, when Winthrop returned from the Second World War, he was quite often labeled as the most eligible bachelor in the United States. He was among the jet set. And of course the press loved his relationship with Bobo Rockefeller as she, uh, as she became known. Um, because she was a you know a, coal, a Lithuanian coal miner's daughter, so it seemed to be like the archetypal rags to riches story, and it was labelled in the press as you know the sort of Cinderella and Prince Charming and all of those kind of things, and you know um, it made national headlines. Of course, the marriage didn't last very long. It was a stormy and short-lived marriage, and you know the, the an, an eighteen-month marriage turned into a five and a half year divorce, which generated even more headlines and of course you know very quickly it uh the metaphor moved from uh uh prince charming and cinderella to the beauty and the beast mm -hmm. and that's the way it was cast and uh one of the reasons that winthrop eventually 
ended up moving to Arkansas. One of the push uh, factors for him leaving New York were the headlines that uh, his divorce generated and the sensationalism in the press. And uh, he'd really had enough of that and wanted to leave New York and head out for somewhere else. So that the marriage and the breakdown of his marriage to Bobo was really a catalyst for him leaving New York City and staking a claim to go somewhere else instead. Mm -hmm. Well, my my cameraman right here did an understudy with Wynn Paul, their son, and he was just discussing that before we began this program. And so it's just uh, phenomenal the links that uh, Rockefeller has had in the state. And I'm, you know, sitting next to a person who actually met the man. So. Yeah, and of course, you know, it, it's very visible today that, you know, there's the Winthrop Rockefeller Institute on Petty G Mountain, which is part of the University of Arkansas system. There's the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation. There's Winrock International. Uh, there's uh, the, his son, Win Paul. Uh, his name is on the uh, cancer center in uh, UAMS. So the Rockefeller name and the Rockefeller legacy still looms very large in the state. Mm -hmm. I am curious. Uh are you familiar with the TV show, I Love Lucy? Yeah. Okay. I remember, as old as I am, there was an episode where Ethel Mertz got a large sum of money, and Lucy lied about it and told Fred that, well, it was her Aunt Yvette that gave it to her. And one thing led to another, and Fred found out that it wasn't her money in the first place. And so Lucy says to Ethel, well, why are you fighting? She said, well, because he found out I'm not Bobo Rockefeller. And I just, when I, when I read your book and saw that Bobo Rockefeller was a real person, et cetera, that back in the 1950s, she had a phenomenal influence that they could even bring it up in I Love Lucy. And so it's just, uh, just if if only reading the book for that one reason to find out who she was a little bit more. I'm glad because I just I've always remembered that from I Love Lucy, and I didn't know who Bobo Rockefeller was. Yeah, well, that's a great reference. I, I haven't seen that one or heard that one before. So thanks for sharing it. Yeah, uh, well yeah, maybe I, I, you know in the in the press when they were divorced, you know, I mean the the settlement figure that was banded around that went and paid to Bobo was about 5.5 .5 million, which is you know, you a can phenomenal like amount. Yeah. Right. So I, you know, that, that figure made headlines. So, you know, I mean, that kind of fits with that anecdote of the, you know, the Isle of Lucy that, you know, Bobo was really seen as the, the person who walked away with a large lump of the Rockefeller fortune. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Something that you brought up in the text, and this was during the war, and Winthrop was offered a petroleum attaché in London, but his father turned it down for him. And he said one of the reasons he said was he thought it was too much responsibility and not a good fit. And that might have been the way Junior was thinking about it. But I personally, in my interpretation, thinking it was more from fear, um, that it was, what would the public think if a Rockefeller avoided serving in the military? What were your impressions about that whole situation? No, absolutely. You know, um, when Winthrop decided to enlist as a private, um, before America entered the Second World War, he enlisted in January of 1941. Just before then, He'd been working for Sacconi Vacuum Oil Company and had toured the Middle East and then toured Europe just as World War II was breaking out there in uh, 1939 into 1940 and came back convinced that, you know, America had a role to play in the war and went to businessmen's training camp uh, up in Plattsburgh and um, readied himself for war and sat down with his brothers and said to them, you know, I think somebody from the family should go and fight on the front lines because we're, we gain more from American democracy than most families. We should be seen to do our bit. And he said, I should be the person to do that because I'm a bachelor. I, you know, I'm not married yet. I don't have children. You all do. Uh, so I'm going to be the one who's going to volunteer. And of course they said, okay, then that sounds good. That sounds like a plan. So you volunteer. So he did. And of course, uh, he always sort of tried to make his father proud of him uh, because he was more of an outlier. You know, he was his father was kind of always on his case. 
and uh, going and enlisting in the military gave, you know, Junior uh, something that he wanted. He could look, point to Winthrop and say, look, the Rockefellers are doing their part in the war. I've got a son who's on the front lines just like yours. We, you know, we're in this together and we're fighting and all that kind of thing. So it was really sort of advantageous for the family to have Winthrop fighting on the front lines at the same time as advantageous for Winthrop because he could get away from New York and the Rockefeller um, orbit and kind of be his own person in the military. So it worked out well both ways. But yeah, I think when Junior sort of um, urged him to stay the course, you know, uh, Junior was, uh, I think I would describe him as a stickler on many fronts. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was determined that since his son had enrolled in the military, he should see it through all the way to the end of the war. And he was kind of insistent upon that. And uh, Winthrop, as a dutiful son, uh, obeyed his father's orders and, you know, left the decision as to whether he should take this job, which would take him along away from the front lines and to a desk job in London, left the decision to his father. And his father turned it down on his behalf and Winthrop accepted that decision. Although I think, you know, uh, when he, um, you know, was almost killed in the kamikaze attack and had several bouts of hepatitis afterwards, he maybe thought twice about that. But uh, mm. at the time, he accepted the decision. But uh, it was pretty faithful. You know, Winthrop was lucky to survive World War II. And, um, you know, the fact that uh, he made it home again made that decision less controversial than it might otherwise have been. This is a great book, and you stop at 1956. Can the audience expect a part two? Well, I very much hope so. Um, I'm taking a breath at the moment, having just uh -huh. finished this book. But uh -huh. uh, I think that, you know, the Arkansas story is just as interesting and exciting as its own way as the, the first half of uh, the story, or the first two thirds of Winthrop Rockefeller's life. He spent two thirds, uh, the book was the first two thirds of his life, and he spent the final third in, in Arkansas, the last 20 years of his life. And there's a lot to write about and a lot to be said about that, too. So uh, it's a great story uh, also waiting to be written. Uh -huh. Well, I hope so, because I really enjoyed reading this book. It Thank was you. it was an academic read, but it's not something that a person would have to have like a, a training in history or uh, a college degree to understand and to appreciate you you write you've got a very good talent for doing that uh to that you could meet anyone of any audience could appreciate this book so i hope that you uh find the time and the motivation to write this because i really think it would be a great book well thank you very much i appreciate yes. it uh -huh. yes now uh dr kirk is uh we want you to sell copies of this book um if people want to contact you or if they would like to buy copies of this book, uh, are you in social media? Yeah, um, I'm at uh, Prof. John A. Kirk on Twitter. Uh, that's my handle, so um, you can you can uh, reach me there. Uh, but uh, in terms of buying the book, it's available at all good local bookstores, Wordsworth Books in the Heights. I know has uh, a good stock of them. So if you want to uh, buy a physical copy and step in, you can buy one there. Um, you can buy them on Amazon or you can buy them from the University of Arkansas Press. So it's, it's available, widely available in all kinds of different outlets, uh, wherever, uh, for your convenience. Uh, so please go ahead and uh, buy a copy. Okay. Well, this has been a great pleasure. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being on this program. It has been a great honor to interview you. Well, thank you so much. Okay. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us today. And if you're interested in reading more from Dr. John Kirk, please visit us at the library or find us online at Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or our website, nlrlibrary.org. Join us again next time and have a great day, everyone.